All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. That was some rich time of worship, even if it was just two songs. Sometimes I feel like, man, you know, Lord, let's break out of just doing two songs. If we ride out and, you know, Michelle and Isaiah do whatever, you know, God can't be bound by man's little structure. We have our little schedule, but, you know, we need to always leave room for the Holy Spirit because there may be a time where he's like, no, you're not even teaching. Keep them. We're just going to have a, I mean, whatever, you know, it's all worship, you know, but uh, a, a musical worship service, who knows? I mean, you know, those things happen. We need to be flexible and moldable, shapeable and pliable, right? If we are in the hands of the potter, amen? Uh but, you know, rich time, I, I, I just, uh, you know, those words really stuck out to me. You know, the Bible talks about how uh, God has a bottle <laughs> and he stores every tear that you shed. And he knows the reasoning behind the anguish and the pain, suffering, whatever it may be that causes you uh, those tears. Sometimes maybe they may even be tears of joy. But I think in, in the context of that song, is speaking of, you know, the, the anguish and the, the tribulation that we go through as, as saints of God living on this earth. So just know that, uh, you know, what you go through is never... It's never in vain. It's never just a, a lost cause, but the Lord knows, and, and he will vindicate you uh, in, the, in his proper timing. Amen? Amen. Uh, it, it's great to see Vicki and Art here uh, this morning. God bless you all, and, and just glad you could join us in person. And, um, you know, I kind of overheard. I wasn't ear hustling, but your road to recovery is, is doing well. So, so amen to that, and praise God for his faithfulness to continue to provide for you and your family everything you guys need. Uh, it's been a it's been a busy uh you know week you know uh you know yesterday obviously you know 911 the anniversary it's been 20 years right since that that account happened and so you know, I just wanted to say real quick just uh you know just a, a a heartfelt uh just you know gratitude for all those who uh gave so much on that day you know they gave their lives uh, a lot of heroes sprung into action out of nowhere not just the policemen and the firefighters but the people who were directly affected in ground zero and across the country we know that you know different places were hit and uh you know i just pray for you know the people that are were left behind the people that are are, are in still dealing with uh, that tragedy uh you may know someone personally that you know had passed on in that that tragic event but in in any event uh, you know, we just pray that we, as we look back on history, uh, whether it be uh, 9-11 or, or whatever, uh, that we would learn from our past, right? And we would look to the, the Word of God and see how, how, can, how can we do a better job of, 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 of serving Him. Uh, we know that these things that transpire are, are to occur, so uh, we can't have, uh, you know, a total peaceful earth. That's never going to be the case, right? Because that's not the way things go, what the Word of God says. But uh, when it's in reason to love your neighbor and, uh, you know, do well next to the, the person beside you. Amen. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to get back in the word uh, this week. Uh, it, it was a great uh, a Sunday last week. We were able to be outside and, you know, uh, going through, again, the, the, the first few uh, verses in, in, the, in the book of Revelation. And then we got some good tacos after <laughs> You know, and got to got to fellowship uh, with one another and enjoy some some time that sometimes we don't necessarily get here in the building. So that was a blessed time. Um, and with that, uh, I'm excited to to go through this next portion of scripture again. You're probably going to notice a lot as I uh, continue to teach through the book that a lot of these lessons or messages are going to be they're going to be like a two part. It's just too, it's just too much to really go through in in the little bit of time we have. So with that, uh, I'll I'll be going through Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 down through 16. Um, And uh, when you get there, if you're able to, please stand. If you can't, it's totally okay. Not not a big deal, but uh, if you can, stand. And I'll go ahead and read our text this morning. We'll pray, and then we'll dive right in. This is a a great portion of Scripture, and uh, I just pray that we're just that much more in awe of who our God and our Creator and our Savior is once we go through our text this morning. So once again, Revelation chapter 1, verse starting in verse 9, going down through 16. And it says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom, 
and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lamp stands, lamp stands, excuse me. And in the midst of the lamp stands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for your depiction of who your son Jesus Christ is. Thank you for your word that is uh, always true and never returns back to you void. It always accomplishes its purpose as it goes out. Lord, this morning, would you have your purposes be done in our hearts? You know the inner workings of us and you know uh, the things that we need. You know the things that need to be eradicated from our hearts and our character. May you do that purging work that only you can do. May you refine us in the refiner's fire. May we be edified and brought forth uh, as, as right before you because of the work that your son Jesus Christ has done on the cross and our proclamation, our acceptance of that truth. We, we rest on the work of Jesus and not our own. So, Lord, may you have your way this morning. We thank you and love you. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. All right. So this is an exciting text. I mean, it just keeps getting better and better and better the more you dig into the book of Revelation. Uh, Today we will begin, I say begin because that's as far as we're going to go. We're going to begin to see Jesus's instructions to the Apostle John. What John was instructed to write down or who he was supposed to address these instructions to. This is important because it shows us Jesus's concern for his body, which is the church. The the, the, the address was going to the church. And this is what Jesus wanted to make known to John. This the things that I'm going to reveal to you, they're going to be revealed to you and they need to be brought to the church, to my church. Speaking of Jesus, he wanted his church to know these things. We will also see uh, John's description of how he saw Jesus Christ. Remember when this is a vision of what, what the Lord is going to do when he comes back for his second advent. So he's John is, is seeing the, this vision or this picture of Jesus Christ in his glorified state, if you will. This is a very detailed view of the Lord's splendor and majesty, of his greatness, right? The way uh, it was depicted, the different things, how it said his hair was, how it said his eyes were, how it said he had a golden sash across his chest, the way his uh, feet were, and all these different descriptions are very uh, particular in how they describe our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a vivid reminder of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, who is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Amen? Several main points I'd like us to focus on this morning. And the first one is this. As believers in Jesus Christ, we must patiently... Endure tribulations through the power of Jesus Christ. You see, the first part of that <laughs> that, 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 that point, it kind of doesn't sound good, does it? It says, okay, so 
If you identify with being a believer of Jesus, it's not saying, oh, man, you're going to get all this good stuff and it's going to be so fun for you. And it's just going to be candies and apples and roses every step of the way. No, it says that you are going to patiently endure. How are we doing on patience this morning? (laughs) You know, I struggle with patience day in and day out. I'm like, man, Lord. How am I the pastor of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a small group of people when I struggle with so much patience? I'm like, I only, I only have two children. <laughs> you know, my wife's like, what are you doing, man? You know, like, what are you doing? And, and, and so I, I admit willingly that this is an area of continual growth uh, that I need personally. But it's not only patiently. But the, the, next, the next word says, endure. How are we doing on endurance today? <laughs> you know, because there's some people, when it gets tough, they buck out. They're like, I'm gone. I just heard a message this morning, and the pastor was talking about, you know, the Bible speaks of, you know, a friend is meant for times of adversity, a true friend. So now, if you have friends that are only around when it's summer season and everything's a-okay and money's in your pocket and the you know wind is blowing in your hair right and you don't got a pimple and and and, and everything's good you know but then when you don't have money and you got a breakout maybe you got Crohn's disease I don't know right but it starts getting raw and they buck out the bible says that's not a true friend there's no such thing as a fair weather friend and this has everything to do with us enduring, enduring. And the next word, tribulations. <laughs> who wants to, how are we doing with that? <laughs> who wants to deal with tribulations? You know, but, but I love this last, last statement. It doesn't say that we're to do this on our own. We're not supposed to patiently endure tribulations in our strength. It says through the power jesus christ oh, that is that's that's it right there that's that winner winner chicken dinner you you got it if you understand if that correlates to your connection to christ you have understood what the text is trying to explain to you it's so important it's extremely important for believers not only in the apostle john's time when this was written but for believers of all time periods right um you know, I was briefly talking to Michelle earlier this morning before service, and, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of whacked out stuff going on. Uh, I think I talked to Lou about this last Sunday, but, uh, it, you know, if you look up uh, on it, uh, Harvard, they got a brand new uh, head chaplain, Harvard University, you know, the esteemed Harvard. And he's a Jewish man who is an outspoken atheist. Do we see a severe problem with that what are we doing we are very behind the eight ball when we say oh oh that's great oh that's fantastic oh it's it's so inclusive that we just oh yes i thought you know uh i know that tony evans son i think his name is jonathan evans he's the chaplain of the dallas cowboys i think his main responsibility is to pray over those uh, players for the Dallas Cowboys that are believers that want to go before the Lord before they get into a game and, you know, get whatever spiritual counseling they're going to get, you know, in the environment that they're in. I thought that's what a chaplain's responsibility is. Or in prison, when uh, prisons will have chaplains, right? It's because it's faith-based. And they usually have a Bible with them. (laughs) And they trust in Jesus Christ. And then, you know, this man comes out and says, I'm the head chaplain of Harvard University, but I don't believe in a true and living God. You know, the writing is on the wall. You know, if we're still living in a state where we need to get right with God, we better get right. You know, I've said this before. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm prophesying. All I'm saying is Jesus said he's going to come back. And if he said that 2,000 years ago, could it be (laughs) his hand is turning the doorknob ready to come back into the room i don't know i mean it could be another hundred years who knows it may not even be in our lifetime and i'm not saying obsess about it i'm not saying get off into some old tangent 
The reality is, whatever the Lord has put before you today, do it and do it well. Amen? And be faithful in what the Lord has given you. But that's just a snippet of like, man, these are the things that are going on in our time period. And that's why we must patiently endure tribulation through the power of Jesus Christ and not cower away and fall apart because of the things that are going on in our society that we see because it's enough to make you seriously sick. Sick with the sin that has so much infested uh, the people of the world today. You know, I mean, I'm so sick with my own sin. Don't let me get started on the sin of other people because that's just, you you know, you end up, you end up getting stressed out (laughs) because you're like, my gosh, what is going on with people? Why do they not see clearly right from wrong? But again, people's hearts are blinded to the truth unless that conviction comes in from the Holy Spirit. The reality is, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you will face tribulation. You will face adversity if you don't know that already. Because it's not a matter of if. Well, only if. I'm only going to trust in Jesus if I have to cross that bridge and go there. And only if it gets tough will I really put all my eggs in one basket and trust in Jesus Christ. No, it's not a matter of if. It's when you will face tribulation um you know personally me and uh, my my wife and i have it's been a rough last couple of weeks it's been a lot of sickness a lot of death uh, that we didn't see coming you know but uh these are things that the word of god speaks of in having to endure tribulation in adversity but it is in the strength and the power of jesus christ and that's a great thing uh you, you look at jesus himself and and he had to suffer for a season to secure our salvation. You think of it. For the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Almighty, to come down into the earth He created and not have a place to rest His head, that must have been difficult. That must have been difficult for Him. Then people say, oh, well, He's God. But He was 100% man. So He walked through every emotion that you and I could walk through and encounter, yet He did not sin to be despised, to be rejected, to be counted as a fraud, to be looked upon and say, hey, you hang with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. You're of no value to us. You think that didn't hurt his feelings? You you don't think that he had moments where he just weeped over the fact that my own creation, this is what they do. They spit in my face. If you are a parent and you have children, you kind of get an understanding of how that is because at one point in time, All of our children have done something or had an attitude of disrespect to us and it hurts and it's painful because it's like, I just want the best for you. And don't you understand that you're, 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 you're hurting me by the way you are rejecting the truth that I'm trying to give to you. And that's, that's, that's our savior. That's what he went through. He went through it to secure our salvation You see, the Bible talks about you and I bearing the marks of Jesus Christ. And you may not face persecution like someone who's a Christian in the Middle East, but you're going to you're going to deal with your own version of bearing the marks of Jesus Christ upon your life. And if you don't and everything's hunky dory and you've never had a problem, you've never been emotionally unstable, everything's always been on the up and ups, then I would really seriously check to see, are you saved? Are you really following Jesus? You may not be following him. You know that there's many people that go to church services that are going to go to hell. It's, it's, and that, that's, that's not a brash statement. That's, that's the reality that a lot of people are walking in deception and they don't even know it. And it's so unfortunate. So, again, we need to be in tune with what's going on and what the word of God tells us. Amen. The second main point is this. The importance of the Bible and the instruction that's found in it. You see, many people have their own ideas of what the key to living a purposeful, fulfilled life is. Some say it's a great education. Um, Others say it's a a well-paying job. While others will say it's to marry and have children. Now, all these things in and of themselves are good things, no doubt. But... Where do people get their reasoning for these things? Where do, they, where do people come up with the conclusion that 
uh, uh, education is, is very important for my, for my future, for my survival. Where do people get, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to have a, 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 a spouse and to have children is, is a very good thing. To have a well-paying job are, 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 are very important to my life. Well, you see, in some way or another, anything that is truly good in this life, it finds its roots and its foundation in the word of God, in Jesus Christ himself. You see, the Bible is the most important, the most thorough book that you could ever read and study to how to live your life the most joyfully on the face of the earth. There, there's, there, you're going to find, and it's not a formula, it's not a recipe, if you will, but it is a guide. The Word of God will show you the correct manner in which to live your life, that you will rise above all of the, the dark things of this world, all of the tribulation, all of the adversity that you will, in fact, have to walk through you can still be joyful and victorious in Christ in that. But it only comes from being attached to Christ, uh, having Him in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, listening and heeding the instructions of the Word of God. You see, its wisdom is timeless. That is the Word of God. Its instructions never fail. And its rebukes offer correction that have the power to save a person's soul. Do you understand that? Before you were a friend of God, before you were a child of God, you and I were enemies of God. And there was a rebuke that had to occur in our lives. There had to be a correction that had to occur. And that correction had the power, has the power to save your soul. And that's why you're in here today. That's why you're in a commune relationship, common union with Jesus Christ, because you've allowed that rebuke to take shape and form in your life. And so it's a beautiful thing. You see, what Jesus had to share was so important that he personally instructed John to write it down, as is the whole Bible, inspired by the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, uh, before the, the book of Revelation, right, would come upon men and they would pen what the Holy Spirit revealed to them in a similar way. But now this is uh, the second person of the Trinity, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, coming before the Apostle John and instructing him what to write down, to get every detail correct so that the church could benefit. You see, today, you and I have the vantage point of being able to learn from all the instruction that the Bible has to offer. Oh, man, we have such, uh, we have such a, a resource at our disposal that, you know, we need to be wise to take heed to the instruction found in the Word of God. Amen? If we don't, we're foolish. We're foolish, and we will be held accountable for our foolishness if we do not choose to be wise about what the Lord has revealed to us. All right, the third main point is this. The detail used to describe Jesus Christ once again proves that there is no other like him. This is a vivid illustration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The, the Apostle John, he, he goes into great length to describe how he saw Jesus Christ revealed to him. You see, this is important because each item listed pertains to a specific aspect of God's unrivaled greatness. These descriptions are given to the reader to help him or her understand the scope of Jesus' rule and reign over this entire universe. That's how it was described. And it would leave you in awe. It would leave you uh, on your knees before him, so to speak, because of uh, just the majesty that is uh, shown through this descriptive writing. So that we may see, again, the magnitude of why he will be praised and worshipped. Amen? That's what we're going to focus on today, those three main points. So let's get into it, and we're just going to unpack this first verse. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Paphmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Okay. We see here... It gives us a, a location. When I introduced this book, I didn't speak on this location because I didn't sense the Lord was showing me it was that 
uh, it was something that to focus on because it was going to come up in the text here. So now we're going to focus in on, well, where was John when all this occurred? It says that he was on the island of Patmos. So if you could picture Alcatraz, we all know Alcatraz, right? We live in the Bay Area. We know in Frisco, there used to be a prison there. That's kind of what Patmos was. It was an island prison for the Roman Empire. A uh, couple quick historical facts about that island. It was rich in marble. That's what they know. And most of the prisoners were forced laborers in marble quarries. So they had to do a lot of you know, heavy lifting, a lot of breaking, a lot of carrying. That's what they did because they were trying to get this precious stone and they were doing with it what they had wished. So it probably would go to the Roman emperor to be in the palace and, you know, look all fancy and nice. That's what they did. Cheap labor. You know, you're, you're in prison. You're in prison for life. Hey, get to work, man. Get those marble uh, rocks broken down. Patmos was a rocky, desolate island about 10 miles long and about six miles wide, just to give you a kind of a scope of, of how much space was there on the island. John was, uh, at the time of his exile, uh, he was on this desolate island. He, he was there. This is where he was. But the interesting thing is nothing, no length of distance can sever the bond between uh, Christians being united to one another and the connection that they have to Jesus Christ, their Lord. Even though John was on this remote island, and we don't know the extent of how many prisoners or who was saved, who wasn't saved, but the fact that he was, in a sense, disconnected physically from other believers, he still held on to his faith in Jesus. And he still had such a direct connection to Jesus Christ that the Lord appeared to him there on that island. That's a beautiful thing. An example, how many times has the enemy tried to silence the church? Many times. It's going on now. The enemy is working overtime to silence the church, the true church, the true body of Jesus Christ. You see, but every time, especially during times of persecution, the church has been raised up. I'm sure you guys have read in uh, the news or whatever you, you read that recently a, a Virginia PE teacher, uh, he was vocal about his refusal to uh, gender bend, if you will, or address certain students by preferred titles, right? He got in a whole lot of trouble for that. He caught a whole lot of flack. They, they uh, you know, they suspended him and said, you cannot work. You cannot do that. You, we, we won't allow that because we're all-inclusive and, and this is what we want to do this is the agenda this is the ideology that we're trying to promote and we want you to jump on board or lose your job but recently he's been vindicated he's been vindicated of that and he was able to return to work and he didn't have to compromise his uh, moral integrity or his beliefs in order to retain his job so praise god for that again for an individual to have the courage to speak up for truth when it's unpopular you know, that's a I, I have a co-worker who's a Christian uh, and, you know, he he um, he does some uh, volunteering on the weekends at an animal shelter. And he told me a couple weeks ago he was in a similar position. Someone had come in, young, young person, about 13 or 14 years old, very nice person. But he couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl or were they they were transitioning, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, he was really he had a really tough time in that situation and he, he kept it you know he just kept it talking about the animals but he was just like he didn't know what he was supposed to do it put him in a very awkward situation uh and and the people that worked there they 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 shoved him to him they know he's a christian they said oh you can deal with them you i don't know what they said you could deal with this person this young person you know and 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 he was thrust into the situation where okay uh wow <laughs> You know, how, let's find some common ground here. I guess the common ground was the, the kitty the person was trying to adopt. But, you know, we see these things popping up more and more in everyday life because this is the environment that we're living in. This is the temperament of the culture we are in. And again, nothing new under the sun. This stuff was going on back in the Roman times. It's just a, a, a different extreme now as the timeline that we're on in the Lord's, you know, map of history. But, but again, these things have gone on. These things have gone on. And it's just, uh, it, it's wild stuff. Um, but back to this man who the, the, the teacher the Lord was not far from him right because in the Lord's time he was vindicated and he was uh, he was raised up and that was a good thing um, 
One commentator, he, he, he writes about this place, Pathmos, how it was. It was lonely, desolate, barren, unhibitable, uh, seldom visited. It had all the requisites uh, for a desired place for someone who wanted to break someone. You know, what do we do with prisoners that are hard to deal with, right? We put them in a four by four box for 23 hours of the day, hoping that they'll break. Many times they do break and they go insane. And they do heinous things to other prisoners when they get the chance because they're treated inhumane in a way where they're they're trying to break them of their dignity, rob them of uh, any human likeness. But you see, this didn't silence the Apostle John. (laughs) That's to show you that the the, the hand of God that was upon uh, the Apostle, that even in this most dire situation, it couldn't silence him. It wouldn't put him to death, his spirit. Question, do hard times diminish your faith in Jesus Christ? When you go through difficult times, are you just quick to give up? Do you turn your back on Jesus because you see the state of the world in the way it is? Or do you press in harder after the Lord? And what I mean by that is for faith to be real, there has to be feet to it. It's not enough to say, I trust in God, I believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, speak to that person next to you. Speak to that neighbor. You know, uh, invite that coworker. Do whatever. I'm not saying invite them here, but, you know, engage with people. Our hearts should be breaking for the people that we see, people that are lost. And we don't know the condition of someone's heart, but we're called to be witnesses, right? And so I ask you that because what, does, what do hard times do to your faith? Hopefully it doesn't diminish your faith. Hopefully it invigorates you to cling to Jesus more and ask the Lord today, Lord, what would you have me do? How can I be obedient? How can I, how can I, how can my life account for the, for your kingdom? And he'll answer (laughs) and he'll give you specifics of what he would like you to do. And that's a great thing. Next we see here, it says for the word of God and, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This assumes that, okay, again, John was on the island of Patmos because he was arrested and imprisoned and he was under the persecution of the Roman Empire. Um, This is probably the case, especially because John said that, again, he is your brother and companion in the tribulation, uh, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Some people also believe that it, it, it might have been that John was a missionary there on the island and either way the application is this as believers we are all connected to one another right as the body and jesus christ is our head as believers we all experience some form of tribulation but this is the thing it is through these means that the lord causes us to grow through the refiner's fire of sanctification we are molded more and more into the moral image and the, and the character of Jesus Christ. We share in the kingdom of God and we grow in the patience of Christ through trial and suffering. There's just no other way. There's no other way. And see, depending on where our perspective is, that's either going to be a downer for you right now and you're, you're, you're disgusted in your heart about it or you're like, okay, Lord, I praise you that you're with me through the storm, right? I think there's a song, I'll praise you through the storm, or, you know, whatever. He, the, the Lord is with you in times of difficulty, and, and this is it. But again, this is how you and I grow. We grow in the patience of Christ through trials and suffering. We will all bear the marks of our Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 tells us this clearly. It says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I mean, it doesn't get any, <laughs> right? I mean, it doesn't even get any clearer than that. I mean, it's plain and simple. If, if you want to live a godly life in Christ, you can want to live a godly life, but not in Jesus. You ain't going to suffer. Oh, I live a godly life. I live a godly life, <laughs> right? You know, I got all kind of this and that. But uh, if you're not, if, if you live, if you live in a godly life in Christ, you will suffer persecution in some form shape or manner it's just you can't get away from it it's the nature of being a christian again if you don't have anything going difficult in your life 
I beg to ask the question, are you truly saved? Are you truly seeking after Jesus? Are you truly being obedient, right? Because it's one thing to hear, but it's a whole other thing to hear and obey and do. See, a lot of people stop after hearing, oh, I hear, I heard the word of God, I'm good. Well, hearing's not good enough. Hearing's just the beginning. He wants you to start moving, have emotion, right? Start living it out. And that's where you start seeing fruit develop in your life. Even in the midst of dark times, there can be much fruit. How is the, I alluded to this earlier. When did the church really grow? When you look back on human history, during times of persecution, right? Not when everything was grand and everything was great. That's when more corruption happened. I mean, just look at the Catholic Church. I'm going to get into that in a little bit later on in the message. Just look at the Catholic Church. You got gold everywhere. You got these sashes everywhere. You got these candles floating around. You got all, I mean, but man, there's a, there's a lot of uncleanliness spiritually going on within that, that group because, you know, a little too much of a good thing, it can corrupt you. The love of money corrupts many men and women. All right, let's move on. Uh, Verses 10 and 11, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Can't believe I got through those names. You know, I've been botching these names, man. It's just, all right. Anyways, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Okay, so to begin with, to begin with in the spirit here has more meaning than saying John walked in the spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh uh, when Paul talked uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It, it's a different idea here. Uh, the idea isn't simply that John was walking in the spirit, but that he had received unique revelation from the Holy Spirit, something particular for him that the Lord was trying to reveal to him. This was a unique spiritual experience for John, what some might call, you know, an outer body experience. You've heard the term, oh, I've had an outer body experience, you know, but this has nothing to do with the occult practices that we are accustomed to in our culture today. It has nothing to do with that. It's, it's, not, it's not something sacrilegious. It's not anything in that idea at all. It says, you can, you, can look at it, you can look at the Spirit as being like this, being in the Spirit, excuse me, uh, basically being carried beyond uh, your, your natural sense into a state where God could reveal supernaturally to you the contents of something. Um, in a similar way, how do we get the understanding of the Word of God, right? There has to be that we're walking with the Spirit. We're being, uh, uh, the Word of God is being revealed to us in such a way that we can rightly divide the Word of God and understand it. Amen? That's, that's how you do it. You don't do it based on your own intellect. You don't, you don't read the Word of God based on your own understanding or else you're going to come to your own conclusion of what you think the Word of God says. You have to have the Holy Spirit within you rightfully divide the Word of God. That way you have the revelation of Jesus Christ and you're able to get exactly out of the text what the Lord is trying to show you. There are actually uh, four references to John being in the Spirit in the book of Revelation. The first one is, we just talked about this at Paphmos, that's in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. Um, Next is in heaven, that's in Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. The next is in the wilderness, that's Revelation chapter 17 verse 3. And finally, on the mountain of God, that's Revelation chapter 21 verse 10, if you, you know, wanted to refer to those on your own time. Uh, So there's four different instances where John was in the spirit, so to speak, and had this uh, specific revelation revealed to him by uh, Jesus Christ. Next, we see this phrase, on the Lord's day. On the Lord's day. Well, when's the Lord's day? When is the Lord's day, right? We have our own understanding of what what we say the Lord's day. People would say, oh, today is the Lord's day. I'm I'm at a church, you know, because it's Sunday. I go to church on Sunday. You see, among the pagans in the Roman Empire, the first day of each month was called the Emperor's Day in honor of whatever Roman emperor was there. Perhaps Christians proclaimed their allegiance to Jesus by honoring the first day of the week as their own Lord's Day. This is the thing about traditions. 
You know, some traditions are good, some traditions are bad. But this is a side note, but I think it's important for us to point out. Uh, you want to be, be wise about how you go about things, you know. And many times we simply just adapt things without questioning where do these customs even come from? What, why, do we, why, do, why do we do that? You know, that, that was when I was called to become the pastor uh, of, of, of this church. That was something that the Lord really showed me. And it's not legalism. It's so not legalism. It's going to the word of God. But I was like, and I wrestled with this and it was heavy on my heart. It was like, and it might seem dumb to you guys, but it was something that I, I just so you know, I anguish over every decision that's made in this church. I never just easily just come, you know, it's, it's like, it's really prayerfully considered. And I struggle with this idea of why are we only offering communion once a month? I have really struggled with that. I'm like, you know, I, 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 you know, it's no disrespect to, to Pastor Nick or anything like that. But I, I just, I really had a hard time with, what is this? When I see in scripture, it said every time the, 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 the brethren meet, we're supposed to commune like that in that manner. And again, it's not a legalistic, ritualistic thing. Because if your heart's not right, you're not going to get anything out of drinking that juice and eating that cracker. It's all about, it's supposed to expose what's going on within your heart to the Lord and you get right before the Lord and then you take it and then everything's good. But it's not an end all be all. It doesn't, it doesn't make you right with God. But I was just like, man, what is this? And that's why we instituted, if you feel led to, you don't have to, but we have the elements there every week for you to partake in because I believe what the scripture says is that's supposed to be available for believers. You see, but I had to question I could have just went along with it and been like, oh, well, we'll just do it once a month because that's just what we do. We're Brazilian Life Church. But it's like, oh, man, I, I, I got to seek the Lord on these things. And, and the same thing is going on here in our text when it's talking about the Lord's day. It, it's very important to know why you are doing something and not just doing it because it's what people around you have always done. Don't just do something just because it's what people have always done. Seek the Lord. Like I said, there may come a time where the Lord's like, Isaiah, Michelle, you're going for more than two songs. We're just not doing this little <laughs> two song and that's it. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. I, I can't, we cannot be locked into this mold of this is how it is. As long as it's not sacrilegious, as long as it's not going against Jesus Christ, we have to give room for the Holy Spirit. Amen? We have to. I mean, if we say he's God then he knows better than us. I'm just a man. You don't want to go on my intellect or my understanding. We want to hear from the Lord, truly. Now, this is not the same term used for the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, nor is it the same idea. You see, the book of Revelation will deal with the idea of the day of the Lord, but it doesn't do it right here. So we're not going to get off. I'm not going to get off further into a tangent about the day of the Lord. Until we come to that time and the portion of scripture will be in then. Next week. Now John says, I heard a loud voice. John heard a very loud voice. This loud voice John heard was clear and striking as the sound of a trumpet. You know, way stronger than what Dizzy Gillespie could play. And he was a great trumpet player. The loud voice belonged to the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, who is the beginning and the end of all things. You see, since Jesus introduced himself with these titles, we learned about this uh, last week, we know that this loud voice was of Jesus. An example here is this. Not that I've ever received the revelation that uh, John, the, uh, the Apostle John received here, but I can remember, so I'm 42 now, I can remember, gosh, 16, 17 years old. I, I spent so many years steeped in you know, uh, substance abuse, this and that, and, and, and you know, uh, performing and, enter, you know, entertaining, recording in, you know, uh, recording studios. I'll never forget this one time, and I know it wasn't the weed or the, 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 the alcohol. I was in a studio room with a bunch of my friends. I heard clearly from the Lord, and he had basically, he was rebuking me, telling me, why am I living like this? And amongst all these people in the studio room, <laughs> <laughs> I just fell on my knees and I was on my knee and I wasn't even saved back then. You know, I was living a sinner just like everyone else I was with, but I was on my knees and people started flipping out. They didn't know what was going on. They're like, what is going on with this dude? Did he OD? He only smoked weed. He can't OD on weed. What is going on with this guy? 
why is he on his knees? And, and people were calling people and people were flipping out. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, looking back on that account, that, that, was, that was one of the first times that the Lord revealed himself to me. And I will never forget, it was bone chilling. <laughs> because he, he just showed me, why, why are you living like this? But it, it put fear in my heart. Like, not fear like, you know, I'm going to get hit, but fear like I don't, I don't even know who you are, but I know that you're so real. And, and it's caused me to go to the ground. The last time I had that experience was, what, was it last year when we had that crazy thundering? The lightning that we've never had out here? That lightning, one of the... <laughs> That lightning sent me to my knees praying. <laughs> Say, praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. This is a, because, you know, the power, the majesty of that lightning, it caused me to fall to my knees and praise God. Because I'm like, man, you, this is way beyond what I can, can, can contain. And could you imagine when he cracks the sky open and comes back, it talks about every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Oh, my goodness. You know, willingly, unwillingly, people are going to fall out. People talk about being slain in the spirit and all that stuff. You know, I don't, I'm not to say that's real or not real, but, you know, if it's a gimmick, come on now. The reality is when he comes back, it ain't going to be a gimmick. And people are going to fall to their, they're going to fall flat on their face. And it's no joke. The application is this. When you and I hear the voice of the Lord, we will be wise to listen up. <laughs> Just when you hear him, sometimes he comes in that stall, a small, still voice. But sometimes it's a, Man, it's and you can tell the difference because, you know, the enemy is going to try to beat you up. The Lord's just going to reveal truth to you. And that truth is enough to send you to your knees. But when we hear the voice of the Lord, we'd be wise to listen up, to give him our full attention, to give him our full attention. Meaning not just hear him, but again, obey whatever he commands us to do. Right. Because we, we end up in a dangerous place when. We hear from God, but we're not quick to do what he says. The disobedience, I've heard it said, disobedience is the graveyard to unfulfilled blessings. Oh, man, you and I miss out on so many blessings when we don't act, you know, and, and, and they're just left there to, to, to rot. Lord's like, I wanted to use you so mightily, but you're just unwilling. You're unwilling. You, you don't want to move when I say move. And the Lord is looking for people. What does the word say? The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. He's like, there's people out there that want to get saved. But where are the true followers of Christ that are willing to give of themselves? You see, because that's what love really is. Love is to give someone what they don't deserve at the most inopportune times when it costs you the most. That's love. Oh, we're going to bring up, uh, you know, uh, Marcus and, and Alyssa later on and pray over them, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what it is. That's love. Any married couple, that's what you know. That's love. When, you're, when your spouse is on your last nerve and they snap that last nerve and you're like, I'm, I'm still going to be your friend by the grace of God. <laughs> I'm still going to love you, you know. But that's love, right? We have, this, we have this weird, twisted idea of what we think love is. But love is giving someone something that they don't deserve when it costs you the most. Oh, and I'm learning that so hard with my kids. Because I'm like, you kids are driving me crazy. Like, Tears is on this trip right now. All she does is cry. I mean, it's a blood-curling cry. She won't leave Veronica's side. She's all, I mean, this is with even her blood relatives. She won't leave her side. And she cries night after night after night. And I'm like, Lord, I can't. I was like, I can't. Do Get up, change your diaper with a good heart. <laughs> Half asleep, uh, stubbing my toe on stuff. You didn't put these, Kayla, you didn't put these toys away. I told you for the 50th time, put all these toys away. But love is giving people what they don't deserve. The most inopportune times when it costs you the most. I mean, you look no further to Jesus. That's what he did for us. Amen. The first and the last. This is a title that belongs to the Lord. Yahweh, the God of Israel. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4 tells us, who has performed and done this calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he, speaking of Jesus Christ. The title Alpha and Omega has the same idea as the first and the last. This is one of the New Testament passages where Jesus clearly claimed to be God. Now he says, he's instructing uh, the Apostle John, 
what you see right in a book. Here, John was commanded to write what he saw. He would have been commanded to write 11 more times in the book of Revelation. And so we get this sense that unless John was commanded to write, he would have just kept it to himself. But he was told to write. The application is this. It's always best to keep visions and revelations to oneself unless commanded otherwise. You see, because that's how you get all kind of heretical teaching. You get false prophets and false teachers popping up everyone, everywhere. Excuse me, People loosely claiming <laughs> that they have some direction from God. And it's, and, it, and it's important and it's imperative that it comes upon your life. You know, people telling you, oh, kooky, this is what God showed me. Oh, okay, well, show me in the scripture where it says that. I mean, this is where you get all kinds of people. You see it in the news. I've read it in the news. All kinds of people, uh, you know, they're killing their family members, claiming that they heard from God. I heard from Jesus. I got to kill you. I got to take you out for your own good. It's like, what is going on? You guys are so whacked out. You guys are following a sadistic spirit that's entangling you in a bunch of mess. And you're unfortunately dragging other people down with you. It's so sad. It's so sad. If they were just in the word of God, they would know. They would be able to discern the clean spirit, the Holy Spirit from an unclean spirit. Um, this is where I'm, uh, you know, I'm not bashing the Catholic Church. I'm just telling truth. It is what it is. An example, uh, this may be old news to you, but it's new to me. Uh, Pope Francis, he, he, he's on record saying that a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous and harmful. That's just like the, 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 the head chaplain of Harvard being an atheist. You're the Pope. You're supposed to be a man of God, and you're telling me a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous and harmful? He says, you have to have the Roman Catholic Church as an intercessor in between you and God. Dude, all you have to do is go back to the Old Testament. The veil's been torn, homie. I have full access to go into the Holy of Holies. I don't need you. But he's deceiving people because in the Catholic Church, you can't read the Bible. You have to go off what the priest says. And they have their own, uh, they don't have their own, they have their own Bible, you know, <laughs> they don't, they don't have the New King James or the ESV or the King James or the NLT. They got some Roman Catholic version. So now you're not like a Berean. You're not studying on your own. You're going off what this man says. And he's telling you, you need me to intercede for you in order to be right. You cannot have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. It's harmful and dangerous. That is satanic. That is a satanic spirit infesting millions of people that I believe truly do have a desire to want to know Jesus, but they're being led astray. And so it's imperative for us to know the difference. Know the difference, right? Jesus talked about the wheat and the tares. You can't tell when they're growing side by side. But one day you will see what is wheat and what is a weed. It's going to be clear. Oh, man. It, I mean, my heart breaks for that. It's like I don't, I, don't get, I don't get a kick out of sharing this information. It's very disturbing to me. But the Lord has to remind me, do you not know the condition of man's heart? Do you, know, do you not know the condition of your heart before he came in and changed me? This is man. And, uh, and by the way, this pope is also, uh, you know, uh, striving for one world government because he's saying that's going to help curb the, 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 the global climate or whatever, the climate change. We talked, I talked about this last week at the park. All this nonsense about global warming, it's all sin. It's all, it's the wrath of God being revealed to mankind. He owns it all. So he's the one allowing nature to act the way it does because of sinful, because of an adulterous, sinful generation refusing to repent. And so he's saying, I'm going to allow calamity to come upon this earth. That's why you're going to see the subways in New York flooding. And down south, hurricanes. And now we're burning up and we can't get water. We need, I said this last week, we need some of that flood from the subway to come over here and just sprinkle on us. <laughs> well, Veronica said it was, it was raining on Friday morning in Mountain View for what? I don't know, 20 minutes? I don't know. It didn't do much. But you know what I'm saying? Why are these things happening? It's because an adulterous, wicked generation is choosing not to repent. And so the Lord's saying, you know what? I'm going to allow calamity to come upon the face of the earth. There is no global warming. It's sin. Call it what it is. But they don't. They don't want to because man-made wisdom for a man-made solution for a problem they're trying to fix, it won't happen. All right, I'm sorry. I will not rant about that anymore. Let me get back to the text. 
Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now Jesus is, again, he's being specific. He's saying, write down what you see, and I want you to send this letter to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay? Each of these churches uh, are in the region of the Roman providence of Asia. This is where they were back then. But these were not the only churches in this region. For example, there was a church in the city of Colossae, which the Apostle Paul wrote the letter of Colossians. But the city of Colossae isn't mentioned in these seven churches. So why are these specific seven churches chosen? Well, some suggest it is because they are arranged in a roughly circular pattern. I'm like, I'm not buying that. (laughs) I kind of think, you know... uh, it's better served in this sense. Many believe these seven churches were chosen because the Bible, in the Bible, the number of seven is often represented as completeness. These letters, all that are in the book of Revelation, are written to the complete church, not only these seven churches, right? The Lord by these seven churches signifies all the churches of Jesus Christ to the end of the world. By what he said to them... It is designed to show what the state of the church, the churches are in all ages, what they will be and what their duty is. So it's also interesting when you look at the Apostle Paul, he wrote to seven churches. He wrote to Rome, uh, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi and Thessalonica. The application is this. As we continue to go through this study of the book of Revelation, us, this church here, Resilient Life Church, we, we will... We will see these seven letters, and we will see parts of every church within our own congregation. We will. <laughs> if you don't, you have a, a, a hardened heart and you have a pride issue. Because if you're to say, oh, I'm not lukewarm like Laodicea, no, there's moments where we're lukewarm. There's moments where we're like Philadelphia, and we're really good. <laughs> but you're going to see bits and pieces and bits and pieces of the different characters of the church within this part of the body. It's going to be a great time of great conviction. But it's also going to be a great encouragement and a time of great correction and growth if you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Amen. That's what I truly believe. And that's what the Lord, that's why the Lord wanted the church of all time to see, to read this book of Revelation, to grasp what's going on and get something out of it so we could be blessed by it. All right. Verse 12 says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and On turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. He says he turned and he saw a voice. We could only imagine that when he turned, he saw Jesus Christ. The voice he heard was probably not exactly the same sound as he remembered Jesus' voice before, as it was described as a trumpet. Yet he knew from the voice, the voice's self-description, that it was Jesus Christ. This was John's opportunity to see Jesus again after knowing him so well during the years of his earthly ministry. But first, he he didn't see Jesus. He saw the the golden lampstands. These were not candlesticks. They were not menorahs, uh, but they were freestanding oil lampstands. That's what they were. The lamps were set on the lampstands. There were seven separate lampstands. This is an image that reminds us of the golden lampstand that stood in the tabernacle in the temple. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 down through 37. But yet this is different what what, uh, John is describing. You see, the old covenant lampstand was one lampstand with seven lamps on it. Here in the new covenant, we see seven different lampstands. You see, in the Jewish tabernacle, there was one golden candlestick and seven lamps to give light. But John sees seven lampstands here. This is, the, this is the understanding that we should get from this text. God has but one church for the Jews, but many among the Gentiles. But notice that the light doesn't come from the lampstands. Light comes from the oil lamps themselves. The stands merely make the light more visible. The application is this. The lampstands are the picture of the church. But you see, you and I, we don't produce the light. We simply display the light of Jesus Christ. A lamp is not light in itself. It is only the instrument of dispensing light. And it must receive both oil and fire before it can dispense anything. This is so important for us as the church. Because no church in itself has either grace or glory. 
It must receive all from Jesus Christ, who is our head, or else it can't dispense either light or life. You see, just because we call ourselves a church doesn't mean we partake in the authentic church of Jesus Christ's body. Many people call themselves a church. (laughs) And many organizations that say they're a church and not necessarily a church. They're just an organization. They're running a business. They're running a Ponzi scheme. They're not a church. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, Jesus was in the midst of these lampstands as the Son of Man, a figure of glory looking back on Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I won't read that, but if you want to write it down, you can check that out on your own time. Though the title Son of Man sounds like a humble title, in light of this passage found in the book of Daniel, it is not a humble title at all. You see, he's clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. The clothing of Jesus indicates that he was a person of great dignity and authority. Long garments back in that day were worn only by those who didn't have to work much, right? People who had a lot of dignity and a lot of importance. So they were a picture of great statue and authority. An example, think of um, the father of the prodigal son, right? You remember the story, right? The prodigal son comes back. He's off afar. What happens? The old man sees him. He bucks out. He's running. He's an older man. For one, in the Jewish culture, old, culture, excuse me, older men were not supposed to run. That was a sign of humiliation. Secondly, he was wearing that long garment. First of all, just out of physics, he could easily trip over something like that. And two, again, it's showing, speaking of, you're humiliating yourself. Why are you running? You're a noble, older gentleman. You don't run. But this shows the great love that he had for his son. He didn't care what he looked like to anyone else. So, whatever, that's my son. He's come home. I'm running after him. I'm going to greet him. I'm going to hug him. I'm going to kiss him. Hey, get the signet ring. Go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a feast and a party. That's what he did. And that's how God is for us. You know he pursues you and I. He's not ashamed of you. In your wretched state, he saved you. That's why we should never be ashamed of worshiping and praising God. Now, I get it. If it's your thing where... You're not, you don't want to get up and shout or whatever, but there should be a praise on your lips for the Lord. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't, don't, who cares what anybody says? I know Maria don't care. She out here shooting us, hallelujah, whatever. That's good. That's a good thing. We shouldn't be ashamed of the Lord and what he's done for us. The golden band around the chest probably hints to the garment of the high priest. And we're going to wrap it up. We're going to, we're going to wrap it up here, and I will continue on verses 14 down through 16 next week as a... Uh, The worship team comes up. I'm just going to finish this last little point and we'll pick up because we're running out of time. But in Exodus chapter 29, verse 5, it says, Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. So this is just explaining in Exodus chapter 39, there were, there were golden threads in the bands that went around the chest of the high priest of Israel. That's how the, the priest was dressed, right? But now let's, let's go back to Jesus. Jesus' band had more than a few golden threads. It was all gold. <laughs> Not only a few little puny bands, the whole thing was gold. How much greater is the eternal heavenly priesthood of Jesus? You see, one of the duties of the Old Testament priests was to tend to the golden lampstand in the tabernacle. Every day, they had to fill the oil, clean the suit, and trim the wicks. They had to closely inspect and care for the lamps so that they would burn continually before the Lord. But here is Jesus Christ, our high priest, in the midst of the seven lampstands carefully inspecting and caring for the lamps, helping them to always burn brightly before the Lord. The application is this. Jesus is always looking out for his church, trying to correct us when we're wrong and we need encouragement and correction. The question is, are we willing to accept his correcting hand? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for... Lord, your, your truth, 
or that pierces through the darkness or that gets a hold of us that allows your correction to come in. Lord, today, may you do a mighty work in our hearts. If there are areas that we have not given over to you, there are areas that we just need work on. Would you do the tender work that only you can do and show us how to live correctly before you, Lord? May we be a faithful witness to the world around us. We know that many people are desperate for something. They don't know what it is, but they need you. They need Jesus to be in their lives. Would you have mercy upon us that we would be clean vessels for your usage? And would you be merciful upon those we come across that they would take heed and hear the words that are spoken so that they would have eternal life and not perish? Father, we thank you and we love you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.